Hi everyone, Mrs. Rinker here. Um, so today we are going to look at how the Allies actually changed the course of the war. Because as you know from your work yesterday, when the US first joined, things were not looking so great, right? Um, the, the British were still struggling and being besieged by bombs and night raids from the Germans. France was clearly occupied. And Stalin was kind of all by himself trying to, you know, keep the Germans at bay on the Eastern Front. So things weren't looking so great. Even for the US against Japan, they were really suffering more losses than they were making advances uh, in Japan's onslaught into the Pacific. So how did that finally change? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. All right. The Allied advance changing the course of the war, how the Allies began to chip away at the Axis advantage. Now, one thing I want to make sure to note before we go forward here is right from the beginning, when the U.S. first joined um, the war effort in 1941, Stalin had been pushing really hard for um, an allied invasion on the Western Front. Why? Well, it makes sense. It would take some pressure off of him, right? If Germany is fighting both Stalin in the East and um, Britain and the US on the West, then their forces will be divided. And, you know, hopefully that would leave some weaknesses that perhaps could give, you know, especially Stalin in the East some advantages. Um, but that didn't happen until 1944. And I want you to kind of keep that in the, in the back of your mind as we go through this. Um, why such a delay and maybe was that delay worth it? All right. So let's dig right in here. How did this all come about? Well, first let's look at turning the tide in Europe. One of the first things that the Allies had to kind of focus on is making sure their supply routes were safe. Okay, i.e. get rid of this U-boat problem. Oh, look, again, we have a U-boat problem, just like in World War One. U-boats were extremely successful in uh, attacking and sinking merchant ships. Actually, up until about 1943, they had sank 3,500 merchant ships. Interesting note, some of them are actually quite close to uh, US territory. There's actually some places off the coast of North Carolina where you can see some wreckage from some of these uh, different attacks. So much closer to home than we ever like to imagine. But nonetheless, these U-boats were very, very successful in cutting off these supply lines, so much so that at one point uh, the British were actually worried that their citizens might starve to death because they couldn't get any of the resources in. So how did the Allies go about getting this under control? Well, one of the things that they made good use of again was convoys. Remember from World War One, that was very successful. So convoys, essentially, you're just taking instead of one merchant ship, you take a big group of them all together, right? Power in numbers. And then you also make sure to have some battleships kind of stationed on the outside for protection. Now, it wasn't just that that really got a handle on this problem. It was also some really important new technologies. And that all came together really in 1943. And one of those new technologies is something that is very common nowadays, and that's the use of radar. Um, so radar was this brand new thing that allowed us to essentially see at night. And if you're not familiar with radar, I'm sure you've seen it before. Um, but essentially what, they, what it does is it uses something similar to like what a bat does with echolocation, shoots out a little sound wave or um, something to that effect. When it hits something, it bounces back and lets you know that there was something there on your screen. So it'll put like a little dot on the screen. Um, on, on TV or movies, you've probably seen it. It's a bunch of little concentric circles, with a little line going around and it kind of makes a beeping noise every time it hits something or finds something. Anyway, radar was really helpful in getting to spot these U-boats at night, right? Um, because the U-boats, especially since they're mostly underwater, are really difficult to see um, and launch any kind of counterattack should they come up. Another um, really important thing, or a couple of things rather, are some new weapons that were invented to attack these U-boats. 
One of them was the use of long range aerial bombers. So planes that could drop bombs down into the water against these U-boats. Um, also the use of depth chargers. And these are kind of interesting if you're into military history and weaponry history. These are really interesting things. Essentially, they're set to explode once they hit a certain depth, a certain pressure of water. Um, and these were really effective in uh, taking out some of the U-boats as well. So all these things combined allow the Allies to get a handle on their supply lines. OK, so now we can get food to the British and eventually weapons um, planes, tanks, and in the long run, people, right? If we want to do that Western invasion, that would be something that will be really key is having a safe way to get people over there. All right, um, now let's take a step over and look at what Stalin was doing, because he certainly was pulling his weight in this war. Um, the Nazis had been um, nonstop attacking him for, you know, since the start of the war, essentially. Um, the, now, at this point in time, the Nazis had advanced all the way to, you know, the very edges of Russia and into some former um, Russian, well, Soviet territories. Um, and the Nazi plan at this point was to take Moscow, Leningrad, and Stalingrad, all key areas for industries and resources. Also, Moscow being the capital, that would have been, you know, a big symbolic uh, victory as well. As well as Stalingrad, right? A city named for Stalin, that would have been a big victory as well. Now, uh, their resources started to get spread a little thin, so the Nazis instead decided to focus just on Stalingrad. And the reason, the main reason for that is there were some oil fields nearby. So that would be a really key resource to help keep the, the war machine of Germany going. Um, now, how did that go? Turns out not so well for the Germans, partially because they made the same mistake that Napoleon has made and so many people after him. You never want to get stuck in Russia in the winter. Um, so first off, it was a very slow assault. Um, it was a very urban warfare. So trying to get house by house, block by block, really, really difficult. Um, and the Soviets, you know, historically speaking, are are pretty, uh, you know, a tough opponents. They don't give up easily, even when they're, um, you know, pressed for resources and starving, they still are not, you know, going to give you an inch. Um, and the Soviets actually were able to launch a counterattack and trap the German forces at one point. Um, so it looked like they should just surrender, the Germans should surrender. But Hitler would not allow a surrender. He still had this vision of, you know, a Nazi empire going from coast to coast, right? Um, so taking all of Russia as well as, you know, the rest of Western Europe. <clears throat> Now, this ended up being a massive mistake. Why? Because it's winter time. So the Nazi forces were left with no food and suffering from frostbite as well as falling ill because of the poor weather. Finally, in January of 1943, Hitler allowed um, his men to surrender. And this was really the official end to kind of Hitler's dream of European domination because he couldn't get the USSR. He couldn't get the Soviets. That was it. Um, so no more advancements made by the Nazis um, into the Eastern Front after that point in time. All right. Now, at this point, the Germans are much more on the defensive. This is a good spot for the Allies to be on, right? Um, Hitler is trying to just kind of save his resources and make sure the territories that he still has are well fortified. So in 1943, Churchill and FDR get together in Casablanca to kind of plan their next moves. Um, and they decide not to do a Western invasion yet. They're still holding back on that. Um, and instead, they decide to focus on bombing Germany to try to disrupt some of those industries um, that are supporting the war effort and also to invade Italy. Right. Remember, Italy is still part of this Mussolini, who is in charge of Italy. Um, so that is the game plan. They also decided at this point that they would only accept an unconditional surrender. And what that means is once the allies um, will have won, right, because that's their their vision at this point, Hitler, um, Mussolini from Italy and Tojo from Japan cannot stay in power. They will have to be removed from power and most likely prosecuted. But 
those parts weren't really detailed out at that point in the game. Just they can't be in charge anymore. Somebody else has to. All right, so let's look at the Italian invasion first um, before we get to the uh, bombing raids on Germany. Uh, they decided to take Sicily first. Why? Because the Allies had actually by this point had taken North Africa. They had pushed out all of the Axis powers from North Africa. So they had a pretty good jumping off point to get to Sicily. Because if you remember from you know geography, um, Sicily is kind of floating around in the middle of the Mediterranean there. So um, they launch an invasion that ends up being actually a very fast campaign, 38 days, and the Allies have taken over the whole island. I know that sounds like a long time, but often some of these, uh, these battles can take you know, months, and this is really just one month, so that was pretty quick. Um, the Axis powers did escape, so it wasn't a full surrender, but um, this was the beginning of the end as far as the fascists being in control in Italy and Italy re really being any kind of a power uh, to support the Axis powers. Um, it was at this point that the Italian government um, officially kind of kicked out Benito Mussolini. Like, yeah, we're done with you. Nobody likes a loser and you clearly lost. So we're moving on. Um, and this also paved the way for an Italian invasion, right? Because now they have a really good jumping off point um, to get to the mainland of Italy. So the official surrender comes in uh, September of 1943. And just five weeks after that, Italy is like ready to swap sides. Remember I tell you always, you know, never trust Italy. They are, they're always shifty, they always swap sides. Well, here's another example. Um, they actually declared war on Germany five weeks after. So they're no longer part of the Axis powers. Now Mussolini managed to escape to the north. Um, and what ended up happening is that um, Hitler sent down some reinforcements to Northern Italy as well. So this prevented the Allies from really taking full control of the entire mainland. And if you also, if you know from geography, the Northern Italy that's close to the Alps, very mountainous, difficult terrain. Um, so this part of the fight ended up taking quite a long time. Um, sometimes the use, ooh, excuse me, look at that, my little Facebook alert. Um, Sometimes the Allies actually had to use mules rather than vehicles to get their supplies up. Also keep in mind, you know, the Allies were trying to advance up into the mountains, right? Um, so the Germans and the what was left of Mussolini and his forces really held the better position because they're up high, generally speaking. Um, so that fighting actually continued on until 1945 when finally Mussolini was captured. So. But long story short of that, essentially Italy's out of the picture. They're not a major threat anymore, even though the fighting continues in the north. All right, how about those bombing raids on Germany? Um, as I mentioned before, Stalin was continuing to put pressure on the Allies for a Western invasion, but that won't happen until D-Day um, in 1944. So in the meantime, they launch uh, a bomb assault on Germany from English bases. Gosh, these alerts, sorry, you drive me crazy. Um, so these assaults would only happen at night and the idea of it was saturation bombing. So they wouldn't just drop one bomb, they dropped like a hundred bombs on an area. The point being to inflict like the maximum amount, amount of damage. Um, and it was really political and industrial centers that were targeted, places where they knew either higher up leadership would be or were places where a lot of the manufacturing of tanks and guns and so forth was happening, right? They're trying to take out some of the key parts that was allowing Germany to keep pushing forward, right? Stopping the war machine. Um, it was actually this assault on Germany that the Tuskegee Airmen became really famous for. So this is that African-American squadron. Um, there was actually a movie made about them not too long ago. I can't remember the name right now. 
But in any case, um, they played an essential role in these bombings. The most successful squadron of any um, that were flying during this time. Um, they flew over 1,500 missions over enemy territory, and they never lost a bomber. Now, to give you a little perspective on that, generally there was about a 20% casualty rate, meaning like one out of every five planes that would go do this would get shot down or damaged in some way. But that never happened happened to the Tuskegee Airmen, which is pretty incredible and really speaks to their skill um, with this uh, campaign. So just a little historical side note um, on the Tuskegee Airmen. Um, now, this, uh, this bombardment of German forces and political centers did help take some pressure off of the Eastern Front, right? They were actually having an impact on some of those resources that the Germans would need. Um, but it wasn't everything. Right. Um, it was not a Western invasion, which is really ultimately still what Stalin needs and what Europe needs. Right. There's no way to liberate France and Poland and all these countries unless we actually get in there. OK, taking a break from Europe now and we're going to look uh, over at the Pacific. OK, um, so if you remember from uh, your work yesterday, um, it was not going so well for the U.S. in the Pacific. We had very little success. Um, you know, some morale boosts with the Doolittle raid, but that was about it. So how did all of that change? Well, the turning point in the Pacific was the Battle of Midway. And this actually, there is a film that came out a, about a year ago called Midway, um, all about this, this kind of epic uh, event, this epic time in history. I have not seen it, but I've heard good things. Um, so what happened here? OK, well, Admiral Yamamoto um, had decided to focus on Midway. This is a naval base in the Pacific. The idea being um, this was the only other major base uh, for the US out in this area. So if they took this particular base, this particular island, then the US would have to pull back a lot of its forces to California, because that's the closest spot they have. Now, the other thinking was is that Japan could then advance um, over to the Aleutian Islands in Alaska, right, with the goal, you know, Japan's goal being, you know, eventually take over uh, Canada and the, and the western part of the U.S. Now, luckily for uh, the U.S., uh, some Navy code breakers actually intercepted the me a message about this attack. Um, so what did they decide to do? Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Admiral Chester Nimitz actually um, decided to let the attack carry out um, as if they had no clue. But um, what he did in preparation for this attack is he sent all available aircraft carriers to Midway. So all of the US forces that were around in the Pacific, he sent them all to Midway. Now, the Japanese aircraft carriers had been spread out across the Pacific because they thought, oh, this is like, you know, shooting ducks in a barrel, right? Whatever the phrase is. Um, we'll be able to take this out and then, you know, hop right over to Alaska and start taking all these other little islands. Um, now, this ended up being a, a big mistake, right? But they didn't know that the U.S. had intercepted this message. So the Japanese attack um, goes is carried out June 4th, 1942. Um, what happens? The U.S. kicked some butt, okay? They sank four Japanese aircraft carriers with 250 aircraft and many experienced pilots. So this was a massive hit to the Japanese resources out in the Pacific. And the U.S., by contrast, only lost one aircraft carrier. That's pretty incredible considering, you know, how well the Japanese had been doing up until this point. So this was the first really decisive victory, unlike Coral Sea, which had really just kind of been a retreat, right? That wasn't a full on uh, victory. So at this point, um, the U.S. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't get this to go away, but um, I'll post these notes up as well so you can see these um, if you want to take a second look, but I'll talk you through them too. All right. So at this point, um, with uh, the, the fighting in the Pacific, the U.S. is finally able to go on the offensive and start pushing Japan back towards the east. Um, or towards the west, right back towards Japan. Um, so they, the U.S. was able to take Guadalcanal, another really key base, and that was a longer fight. It took three months, but they still got it. 
Um, and this was generally part of a larger plan to attack from um, many different points, from both the Southwest and the Central, in order to force Japan to kind of split their forces. Ultimately, the same plan that will be enacted against Hitler, right? The more angles we can attack from, the more they have to divide their resources. Um, and now another uh, part, and it's cut off at the bottom here, I apologize for that. Another key part to this is that um, as they captured these islands, it also gave the US more spots for their bombers to be able to land um, and take off from so that they could eventually la launch attacks on uh, the mainland of Japan as well. So another helpful thing. All right, so the US is back in action, right? Oh, why is it not letting me? There we go, okay. So tides are turning. The allies are finally making some advances against the Axis powers, which really for the first few years of the war, mind you, you know, the war started in 1939. You know, um, to some accounts, 1937, really, when uh, Japan first invaded China. So this had been a long onslaught of the Axis powers really just taking more and more and more. So finally, things are kind of coming together and the Axis powers are being forced to consolidate and pull back a little bit. Also, I should mention here something that was kind of helpful for the allies is that they were working together, right? They were planning together, meeting together in order to launch these invasions and these different uh, strategies. Whereas the Axis powers really didn't do that. They would kind of send reinforcements, like when Hitler sent reinforcements to um, Mussolini in Northern Italy. But aside from that, there wasn't a lot of pre-planning involved in um, their strategy. So that also worked to the Allies' advantage as well. All right, now back to our big question that I kind of posed at the start of this lecture. Um, very early on, when the US first joined and the Allies all came together, Stalin had really been pushing hard for an Allied advance on the Western Front. Um, but FDR and Churchill both delayed this until 1944, um, June, right? That's when D-Day finally happened. So what I want you all to look at now is, do you think this delay was necessary? So um, in order to answer that, I want you to complete the assignment World War II by the numbers. Um, also, please keep in mind things that I talked about in this lecture, um, different elements that you know may or may not have been uh, important to that decision. All right, can't wait to read your responses and I'll see you all soon. Bye.